Okay. Um, we're going to wait till the room fully populates here before I get started. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So, uh, hi, <laughs> and and good afternoon, um, uh, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is uh, Sean Miller, and I am the program director uh, at the American Academy in Rome. I've been here for eighteen years, and that entire time I've been running the Rome Prize competition or working with the Rome Prize competition. So I'm here to give you some general information about applying and specifically for the landscape architecture category. Uh, though it's you know, basically the information I'm gonna share is pretty much universal, but I'll try to uh, touch on a few things that are specific to landscape architects. Uh, so I'm gonna go over that for a few minutes. Uh, we are then gonna have a conversation with a recent Rome Prize winner, uh, Lauren Stimson, uh, who was at the Academy uh, last year. And then at some point, <laughs> uh, we're not sure yet because he just landed from Rome, our president, Peter N. Miller, will be joining us uh, just to give an overview of the Academy and, and give you the kind of bigger picture because uh, the information I'm going to pro provide is specific to the application and to the Rome Prize competition. Uh, but when Peter's here, he'll give us an overview of the Academy. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with these basic information. Then I'm going to introduce Lauren and we'll have a a conversation with her, and then we will open it up for Q&A. Okay, so uh, let me start by uh, answering the question, what is the Rome Prize? And I'm going to give you the quantitative aspects of the Rome Prize. So first of all, it is a residential fellowship. In the, ca in the case of landscape architecture, uh, we have two fellowship fellowships available each year. One is a half-term fellowship, which is about five months. The other is a full-term fellowship, which is about 10 months. Um, for the 10-month fellowship, uh, applicants with people who are applying this year, if you're awarded the fellowship, you would start in early September of 2025, and your fellowship would end in early July of 2026. Uh, if you're awarded the half-term fellowship, you would have the option uh, to specify a preference for either starting in September and ending in January, or starting in February and ending in July. Um, so, uh, but at this point, we don't need to know that specific. When you're filling out the application, you can just indicate that you're interested in either a half term, a full term, or that you're open to either. Um, so Rome Prize winners uh, who are selected for the fellowship receive housing. Uh, the basic offering for the Rome Prize is a single room with a private bath. Uh, however, if you're coming with a partner or a spouse, you'll be given a double room with a private bath. And if you're coming with a family uh, with children, uh, you will be housed in an apartment, a multi-room apartment, which is next door to the Academy's main building and a separate building uh, next door to the Academy's main building. Uh, winners of the prize also receive meals, uh, which are prepared by our Rome Sustainable Food Project. Uh, they provide uh, lunch and dinner Monday through Friday. Um, and um, these are available at no cost to the fellow and subsidized rates for spouses, partners, and children. Um, in addition to housing and meals, winners receive a workspace. Uh, for most landscape architects, that would be a studio. However, we have had people in this category who are landscape architecture historians. And in that case, if you're more of a scholarly, taking a more scholarly approach to it, you may be um, given a study instead of a studio, depending on your work needs. And finally, all winners are given a stipend. For the full term, you receive a $30,000 stipend, and for the half term, a $16,000 stipend. And the winners uh, selected all reside at our 11-acre property, which is located on top of the Janiculum Hill in Rome. Uh, it's not right in the center of Rome, but it's very close to the center of Rome, and you can get to most of the historic sites that, are, that many of you have visited as tourists uh, just by walking there, um, uh, although we are up on a hill. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about the qualitative aspects of the Rome Prize. So many of you may have seen our Rome Prize posters the last few years, which say uh, we provide time and space to think and work. And that is something that we feel is a very valuable gift. Uh, but it's not only to think and work, it's to explore, uh, explore the city of Rome, explore Europe, explore um, different sites and uh, and, any, uh, and explore the work that you want to do. Uh, we also give access to uh, different research facilities and we can we have 
somebody on staff whose job is to get people access to either the research facilities or to different sites that may not be open to the public. And so we're able to provide that. And just by being in Rome, you're also, or by be, being at the Academy, you have access to the city of Rome, uh, to Italy, to Europe, and to the Mediterranean region. Um, uh, another thing that is offered through the Rome Prize uh, that's uh, more of a qualitative sense is relationships, uh, both personal and professional. So all of our Rome Prize winners reside at the Academy and they take their meals together. And so it's it's a there's a lot of discussion. There um, are opportunities for just getting to know people personally, but also getting to know about their work and, and collaborations uh, happen serendipitously uh so people you know and maybe different fields will be talking and they'll realize there is a connection and so they may decide to work on a project together this oftentimes happens at the academy during the fellowship year sometimes it starts during the fellowship and continues after uh the fellows have gone home uh the academy also provides opportunity for learning growth and development and so it's it's uh, it's quite a wonderful place, and I think Lauren will test to that when she when she uh, talks a little bit. Um, so as you also may know, we offer the fellowship in thirteen different categories, um, and landscape architecture is you know one of those, and the uh, uh, landscape architecture category encompasses more than just pure landscape architecture. It also can be environmental design and planning, landscape or ecological urbanism, landscape history, um, sustainability and ecological studies, and geography. Um, and another, uh, we are this year introducing for the first time ever um, a fellowship, a collaborative fellowship in environmental arts and humanities. And this may be of interest to landscape architects or those who are interested in landscape architecture. Uh, this is a cross disciplinary disciplinary fellowship that will, uh, as I said, it's a collaborative team that it will be awarded to. Uh, so it will be one artist, uh, which would include a landscape architect, and one scholar. Uh, so it could be um, scholars in many different fields. Uh, they could be people uh, studying the human humanistic studies. They could be studying science uh, related to the environment or anything that's related to the environment. The Artists can be of any field as well. It doesn't have to be a landscape architect. It can be a, um, uh, a composer, a writer, a visual artist. Uh, but this fellowship is intended to um, uh, allow these two people who are working together to work on a project that aims to expand the understanding of the way humans relate to experience or process their uh, with the natural world. And um, <clears throat> I'll say a little bit more about this when I'm talking about collaborations in a bit. So in addition to landscape architecture and environmental arts and humanities, we also offer categories in architecture, design, literature, musical composition, visual arts, ancient studies, historic preservation and conservation, medieval studies, Renaissance and early modern studies, and modern Italian studies. And then we have a another fellowship called the Sal Family Rome Prize, which can be awarded in any of our humanities categories but it's for a scholar who is working on the historical intersection of China and the Mediterranean and arts and ideas. Uh, so if you're interested in any of those other categories, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, with any questions, or you can um, look on our website for more details. Um, to be eligible for the Rome Prize, uh, specifically for the landscape architecture category, you must be a United States citizen. Um, you must hold an accredited degree and be practicing in the discipline. This does not mean that you necessarily have to have a degree in landscape architecture, but it should be a degree that allows you to work as landscape architecture or whatever work you're doing that would fit into this field. Um, previous winners of the Rome Prize are not eligible to apply. Undergraduate students are also not eligible, eligible to apply. Um, and if you're a graduate student studying landscape, landscape architecture at the time, might not be the best time. You might be able to apply this year, but you probably you wouldn't be able to do your coursework most likely because we would require you to de dedicate yourself to the project that you're proposing uh, for the fellowship. Uh, but if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to me and, and we can uh, see if your particular situation works. Um, 
Uh, let me see here. Uh, the deadline for applying this year is November 1st. Actually, that's the deadline every year. <laughs> and uh, we actually offer two deadlines. So the primary deadline is November 1st. If you apply by that date, uh, it's a lower application fee. But we also ex offer an extended deadline of November 15th. Um, so you get an extra two weeks. Um, and if you apply for that deadline, the application fee is a bit higher. Uh, for the additional time. So I would recommend if you can get it in by the first, but if you need that extra two weeks, just know that it's there for you. And aside from the higher application fee, there is no penalty for applying at a later date. All applications are treated with the, treated equally okay, by our jury. Um, the application requirements are an online application form, so you can access this through our website. There's a link to the portal. Um, you will also be asked to submit a project proposal. Uh, this is a one-page proposal. You can go slightly over that if you need to, but try to keep it under two pages, I would say, uh, explaining what it is that you plan to do in Rome, what you're, what you're working on. Um, and you will be asked to uh, provide a resume or a CV and a work sample. Uh, for landscape architecture, generally for people who are working uh, from the design side of it, uh, we would ask for a portfolio of up to 40 pages in horizontal format for 60, being viewed on a 16 by nine monitor, uh, consisting of images and text. If you are a scholar of landscape architecture, uh, then you would probably, you would wanna submit a, a 20 page manuscript uh, with a bibliography. The bibliography pages do not count towards the total page limit. And also if you have illustrations, those would not count towards the 20 page limit. Uh, and then all applicants for landscape architecture are required to provide three letters of recommendation. So these are best sent by people who know you and your work well. Uh, so be thinking about that when you're uh, listing people to be your references. You just enter their information in the application and then uh, prompt is sent directly to them uh, to provide a letter. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are offering this new arts and environmental arts and humanities fellowship, but we also have another type of collaborative application, and that's for people who are working within the same field. So if you're working with another landscape architect uh, on a project or you have a history of working with them, uh, then you uh, can apply as a collaborative team. Uh, collaborative fellowships are each awarded um, a Rome Prize. So each each person applying it, be, it can be up to three people, but it's typically two people. Uh, so each person would receive their own living space, their own stipend, their own workspace if you need to set two separate workspaces, and um, and each of you would be on the meal plan for the Rome Sustainable Food Project. Uh, collaborators should submit one application with one applicant being the primary. Uh, applicant uh, just for the application purposes, not in terms of the actual fellowship. Um, and then I mentioned I wanted to give a little more information about the Environmental uh, Arts and Humanities Fellowship. As I said, this is a pilot program this year for collaborative eff efforts. Um, e in this case, again, each winner will receive a full stipend, their own individual living space. Uh, however, in this case, they will share a workspace. We don't offer two workspaces for this particular fellowship because it's designed to be a collaborative workspace, a collaborative fellowship. Um, and for all of our categories, applicants, if, if you're applying collaboratively in, in either way, as, as two landscape architects or as an artist and a scholar working together, uh, you need to um, show that you have a history of working together collaboratively. Um, and as with all of our Rome Prize fellowships, in your project proposal, it's important to state how being in Rome or being at least away from the United States will be helpful to your work. So you want to say why this how this opportunity in particular is going to have an impact on your career, and um, and if you can relate that to being in Rome, all the much better. Uh, so the jury isn't specifically looking for projects that are Rome based, uh, but if there are resources in Rome or if there's some connection to Rome that you can draw to the project that you're doing, then that will help move you along a little bit. Uh, but it's not absolutely necessary if you have really strong works. If, if you're just great landscape architect, <laughs> the jury is going to respond to that. Uh, uh, so the last part I want to talk about in these in this overview is the selection process. And um, so this year I will be assembling 12 different juries, uh, one for each of the categories. Uh, but as you mentioned, heard, heard me say earlier, there were 13 different disciplines. So there is one case where there's one jury that reviews two 
uh, disciplines, and that is architecture and landscape architecture. So those uh, two categories will be reviewed by one jury that is made up of both architects and landscape architects, but they're very similar. A lot of people apply for both categories, so we feel it was a that's still a good one to uh, keep uh, uh, as a, a joined group. Um, <clears throat> our juries are comprised of professionals working in the discipline. As I said, in most cases, it'll be architects or landscape architects, but it could also be scholars of uh, design of either architecture or landscape architecture or both. Um, our review process is two-step process. In the first step, uh, the juries review the applications and select finalists. So they review every application that's submitted. Uh, so there's no pre-screening by the academy staff. Um, the jurors see every bit of work that is submitted um, and they select their finalists. Uh, so for example, as I mentioned, we have two fellowships available uh, in landscape architecture, which means we will be uh, selecting four, maybe five finalists to be interviewed. So that's the second part of the process is a, it's an interview. Um, this year, we're going to be doing a hybrid in-person Zoom um, interview process. So the finalist will be brought to New York to our office, where you will meet with me and the president of the academy. But the jurors who will be making the decision will actually be on Zoom. So there'll be a monitor uh, with however many jurors are able to participate. Uh, we require at least three of them to participate in our interviews. So it'll be your chance to meet with them. Uh, them to ask you questions about your project and how you would use your time in Rome, and then they will um, uh, they will um, make the decision uh, of who who will be selected as winners. Uh, winners will be notified a couple of days after the interview, and all winners will be notified of their status no later than mid March of 2025. Um, and then the Rome Prize winners, the 25 26 Rome Prize winners, will be announced in late April. At the same time, we will also announce the names of the jurors who reviewed the applications that year. So that's all I have that I want to share about the process. So what we'll do next is I'm going to introduce Lauren, and then we're going to have a little, uh, a few questions for her. And then, as I said, either Peter will be joining us and giving an overview, or we'll go right into the Q&A portion. So uh, first of all, uh, Lauren Stimson was the recipient of the Gilmore D. Clark and Michael Rapuano Kate Lancaster Brewster Rome Prize during the 2023-24 academic year. A lot of funders went into that one. <laughs> and uh, Lauren is a landscape architect and partner at Stimson, a design studio comprised of landscape architects, artists, planners, and horticulturalists based in New England. She received a master's in landscape architecture and a master's in pl regional planning from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, Lauren's work is deeply informed by Charbrook, her family home and farm that has become the field laboratory for Stimson. Rural life and related interest in the arts, crafts, foraging, and plants have expanded the way she thinks about her design practice. Much of her work explores forgotten histories, wilderness, spontaneity, and emotion. Lauren has been practicing landscape architecture for almost two decades, and her projects range in scale from intimate gardens to public parks and museums to institutional campuses. In 2021, her studio was recognized with the National Landscape Architecture Firm Award for outstanding achievement within the profession of landscape architecture. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Lauren Simpson. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. Hi, Sean. This is a little strange because I can't see anybody, just you. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we have 33 other people okay. out there. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. Sure, sure. Uh, so let me just start by, well, I want to start with a question that's personal, and I didn't actually include this one, but it was something we briefly talked in, in the list I sent to you. But while at the Academy, you started, oh, hi, Peter. <laughs> hi, Peter. <laughs> hey, Lauren. Hey, you made it. I did. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> oh, where so, are, you? are you? Are you at the airport? I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, I just introduced Lauren and we have not started answering the questions yet. So do you want to? Great. Yeah, he should no, jump. <laughs> I think actually, you know, let's go with Lauren and I'll wrap up afterwards because I think okay. Lauren can can really speak um, much, much better than I to the value of a fellowship 
uh, and the way it, it can help think about landscape architecture. Okay, sure. So, um, yeah, Lauren, let's uh, let's just go to, uh, you know, what impact did the fellowship have on your work and on you? Oh, God, Sean, you're going to like the big, you're going to like... <laughs> going for the big one. I don't think I can fully comprehend what the fellowship will do for me career-wise or professionally. Um, it's too soon. I think you even indicated that when you typed this question to me originally. It's yeah. too soon for me to know, but I think um, the biggest thing that I can share is that the, the, the motto of the academy, the time and space to think and work, I mean, that's absolutely true. I have a very fast paced life here at home, and I'm sure a lot of landscape architects who are on this call can relate to that. You know, I own my own practice and we have a firm of over 40 and every, you know, increment of our day has to be billed to a client and held accountable to a project. And there's very little room to um, have the things I would say to go back to that, for instance, the paintings on the wall, there's very little time for me to do unbillable things that influence my thinking as a landscape architect um, because of the client needs. And so having that time in Rome away from clients and the demands of a you know, busy project, you know, focused schedule, is the number one thing that I am so grateful for to have that time away to reconnect back to the things that brought me to the profession in the first place. It's like a much needed sabbatical for someone who's in practice. Sure. So, well, I remember from your final report that you you mentioned the paintings in the final report and uh, how you really picked up doing a lot of that while you were at the academy. What led you to do that, and and is it is it integrating? into your, are you still doing it as, and is it integrated yeah. into your work as a landscape architect? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, so I've, I kind of behind the scenes have taught myself how to paint and for well over 15 years, I've been dabbling in painting all types, oil and watercolor and that sort of thing. Sometimes I'm able to integrate it into my practice during early site analysis phases. I might do some sketches or some studies and share them with a the client but 99 percent of the time everything is either you know a sketch by hand or it's on the computer and it, i'm not able to do these types of explorations and build them to somebody so they've become my outlet on the side and in rome i decided to because i think i had achieved such a, a pace gotten to such a fast pace um, in my practice i needed i knew i needed a break from that and Rome was my chance to do a series of unmeasured studies. Everything in my life at home here in my practice is about measuring, being accountable, detail oriented, you know, getting licensed, keeping up with your licensure, like making sure the business is, you know, is, the business is accredited and that we, we build the projects, you know, and we, they have to be um, legally, like we have a fiduciary responsibility to hold up, you know, our end of the bargain. And that's what a landscape architect does professionally. So I wanted to do a bunch of unmeasured stuff. And that's what Rome was about, like letting go of unmeasured drawings. And I don't know if I'm answering your question completely, but that's, um, I don't even know what your question just was. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, okay. I think, sorry, I'm forgetting it. But I think <laughs> that chance to explore something, and the paintings were that for me. It, it, ironically, they became a way for me to go back to my love of site analysis and the way I see landscape. And I started doing things almost the same way I do them at home here, where I start a project with a new client and I launch into site history and figure out like what has shaped this place over time. Why does it look the way it does? And in Rome, I started before I would do a painting, I would go to a site, I decide to paint it, but I would collect all the stuff from the site. Like it might've been horticulture, you know, like a giant tree branch. I think I sent you pictures of my studio when I was there. There were like tree branches or, you know, artifacts. I mean, you can find so much stuff in Rome. Like just, I go for a run and be a, you know, Villa Pamphili and be digging up, you know, like a mosaic tile and like ceramics and, and all this stuff became my, uh, part of my daily rhythm of like getting to know a site before I painted it. So. <laughs> 
Well, uh, looking back uh, two years ago when you were applying, uh, what, what was it that prompted you to apply? Uh, and what were your expectations at that time? Um, I, I knew very little about the Rome Prize before I applied. Ironically, I had been at, I would say at least two, it involved in two conversations with clients in front of my husband, who's my business partner, um, who clients that said, oh, Steve, you should think about applying for the Rome Prize. <laughs> and I remember asking, oh, tell me what it's about, you know, and because he had had two um, very good friends who had done it, Anita Bearspeta and Julie Bargman. And I never had it in my consciousness, I think, because I went to UMass Amherst um, State School, went to Bates College. I didn't have any mentors in my, you know, alma maters that had done the Rome Prize or were affiliated with it. It has a close connection to places like Harvard. So it didn't feel like it was um, within my grasp, honestly, and within my, um, you know, my language. It wasn't a familiar thing to me. I had a client who became a good mentor and he said, you are really, um, you know, overtaxing yourself between the demands of the office and the amount of projects that you're working on. Like you should think about a sabbatical. And I thought, I don't, I'm not in academia. I can't take a sabbatical. You know, like I own a company that wouldn't be fair to the other people in the firm. And um, he said, I think he could really help you clear your thoughts and think about how you want to take the firm to the next, you know, into the next couple decades. And he was absolutely right. So he actually, his wife was an artist and she said, you got to think about the American Academy. This was like in the end of August. And the, as you said, the thing was due in November 1st. So I, for the month of September, quickly started to think about what am I, I need to throw a portfolio together. So it became a, um, a really revelatory experience for me to put all my you know work into this basket of my own portfolio. I've been working on the firm's portfolio for almost 20 years, but I've never done it for just myself. So that was very cathartic. Um, and the one page proposal was the hardest part, everybody. That was the hardest part <laughs> for me because I'm not an academic. It was like, what do I want to go to Rome for and study? I mean, I just, I was clearly just trying to find, you know, a break from my practice to reconnect to something that I knew I was missing, but I wasn't sure what that was. So it was very personal for me. A lot of people, especially in my cohort, were way more organized. Like they, they had a specific topic. They knew they always wanted to study it. They've been writing a book for 10 years on it. And, that's just not my story. You know, mine is quite different. So I would say I applied last minute. I, everything along the way was like, whoa, whoa, what shot? Are you kidding? What? <laughs> so that was pretty wonderful and exciting for me. Could I jump in, Lauren? I have sure. a question. Like the way you've set it up, it, it sounded like, you know, any place could have been a great place to get away from work and clear your head. What was special about Rome? And and yeah. not just for you, but like what's special about Rome for landscape architecture? Oh boy, Peter. No, you nailed it because I was sort of on the I was thinking, why, why me at the academy? Like maybe, you know, I'm half Asian. I should go to Asia. Like this isn't the right place for me to take a I mean, I literally thought about this a lot. And I talked to several people about it. And I actually, believe it or not, in college studied in Athens, Greece which again was this last minute decision. I had like already decided to go to Spain and I was going to go for the year. And then last minute, <laughs> I decided to go to Athens, which is the birthplace of democracy and the classical stuff. I mean, it totally informed my thinking. So I went back to that love of history that I have as a landscape architect. I cannot think about design without really getting into what what are all the unseen things that have shaped that land that I'm about to work on? And I love history. And I think it's like Rome and it's Athens. When I really think about it, you know, when I think about what informs a lot of our design thinking as in the Western world, you know, as practitioners, and it became pretty clear to me overnight that Rome would be this complete opportunity to be connected to a lot of things that I had no exposure to, that I'd only sort of, you know, had um, exposure to in Athens. And it filled a gap for me in knowledge, the knowledge base that I had, but to see these incredible works of art in the museums, to see the architecture, to be surrounded by it. I mean, the academy building itself is phenomenal and not just because of 
the architecture that you're in, it's because of like the Roman walls that you like get to touch as you walk past, you know, on your way from 5B into, you know, to the other, to Villa Aurelia. It's an unbelievable context uh, for someone who loves history and designs with history at their fingertips, so. Okay. Um, well, what, what is uh, something that surprised you the most about the fellowship and or the American Academy in Rome? Oh, I think um, I really was shocked at how quickly I felt comfortable there in the community itself. And I remember meeting Peter like in the back, you know, alleyway between our apartment complex where he stays on the top floor and my family was living on the second floor and saying to him I don't know I just feel like and he just knew what I was talking about it would maybe this is too much to share with a bunch of people that I can't see but he said he took the words out of my mouth he said the imposter syndrome will go away before you know it and I was intimidated you go up to this building and you're like, holy sugar, this is not, you know, I'm not at UMass, you know, I'm not even like on my farm in central mass. And I'm not, even, I'm not a New Yorker. I don't live in a major city, like a lot of my cohort, but within like a week or two, those meals together, it breaks down so many barriers and you're all in it together. Everyone's feeling the same way and you're getting to know the place and the community and the meals has, it has reinforced so much about, you know, how I want to run my own practice. And I was starting to do some of these things with my own firm before I left, but just the the face-to-face -face contact, the ability to come together for those meals, you know, twice a day, Monday through Fridays to me is so, it's so fundamental to creating um, the kind of culture that I want in my own practice. And I just think I have so much admiration and respect for the way the academy runs itself, not just as a business, but as like a, a philosophy of um, a, a place of education and learning. So I was shocked at how um, the community just sucked me right in and I became part of it. Uh, I didn't expect that. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> How how would you say uh, your time in Rome is impacting your projects that you're working on now? I mean, or or I mean, it's just kind of in the first question, but you know, yeah. is it more specific? I guess so. Oh, I don't. I, you know, I'd say maybe this the the slowness aspect of Rome and Italy in general. Slowness in a good way, meaning take the time to stop what you're doing put your pencil down, put your work down, go down, have the meal, eat, have an absolutely healthy approach to your balanced <laughs> diet, walk your children to school, don't get in the car and drive. I mean, this attitude about, you know, everything here is go, 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 we're a car driven culture. You know, most people live in the suburbs, not in the city around where I am. And I think that Rome, you know, freed us of all of those norms that we have here and gave us an attitude about slowness. So in my projects now, I have been granted, I wish I could do it more, but I have been more deliberate since I've been back about saying, I will get to that. I really appreciate you contacting me. I'm going to need a little bit more time, but I will get back to you, <laughs> whether it's someone in my company or it's my client. But I think that like, very deliberate communicative approach to it's okay to slow down <laughs> yeah um, italy taught me that for sure right well you, uh before we have peter you, oh yeah, sorry do peter. you want to say something more about the meals because you just mentioned it in passing the meals are i i have a potty mouth so i need to <laughs> the meals are unbelievable <laughs> And the kitchen crew are some of my favorite people that I got to know. They are like, we were like family, especially we had kids who were there all the time. And kind of, I was worried about them driving them crazy at Friday night meal nights. But um, I was really concerned about the 8 p.m. meal time. There's a, there's a 1 p.m. lunch, which is incredible. And my husband was able to join me for most of those. I went to almost every single lunch, I think. Um, it's buffet style at lunch and there's 
largely vegetarian options. I loved all the food. I mean, I'm a, not a picky eater. I eat anything. Um, I think some people who really like meat and like lots of protein might feel like, oh, I need more protein. But, you know, as my friend used to do, just go boil an egg if you need, <laughs> if you need more. But I had zero complaints. I mean, you were eating from a group of people who have a food ethic that is so high and they are basically governed by, you know, Alice Waters of Chez Panisse, who I happened to eat at her restaurant as a bucket list thing about 10 years ago. And it's unbelievable. It really is. It's very special. Um, the quality of the food is so high. And um, the mealtime at eight o'clock, I was really nervous about that because I have two kids. I had two kids at the time who were six, uh, five and seven, uh, four and six. I can't remember. Um, and I, that's right at bedtime, right? It's like, I, I think I texted or asked Sean about this many times. There were a few of us mothers who were like texting each other, like, we're going to be screwed. How are we going to do this? And then at the end of the day, we just kind of figured it out. And I really preferred not to miss those meals. And I like fed the kids earlier. I got them to bed and I went And those meal times were, um, they were pretty sacred for me as a way to connect with my cohort and the you know, the other academy staff and the, all the visiting people, so many visiting scholars that were there, residents. Um, Mealtime to me is one of the most wonderful things about the academy. Well, uh, before we have Peter do his overview, um, I just wanna ask, is there any one, is there um, anything else you'd like to share that we haven't touched on that you think is important for oh. people considering? I, I guess I probably want to just answer questions. I'm, there are a few questions in the Q&A, but maybe we, we want to do that after. Um, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, I, anything else? You know, it'll, it can come up during the Q&A. Peter should, Peter should talk. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just gonna, I mean, you know, you're the, you're the star here, Lauren. But I do <laughs> want to pick up a couple of things that you said, just to talk about the meals. Um, you talked about the quality, the care, you talk about the opportunity to meet the cohort. You know, one of the great things about having excellent food is that it keeps people at the table for a long time. And I don't think I'm divulging a state secret if I say that the reason we have and make this big investment in food uh, is because we actually see it as crucial to firing, fueling, the intellectual life of the institution. People spend hours together sitting at the table. I've just come back from Rome and I was there Monday night for dinner, started at eight. The tablecloths were gone by 10 and there were still clumps of people sitting there at 12 talking in the same place. And, you know, to have that opportunity night after night builds not only quality personal relationships, but also and quite often uh, intellectual collaborations. And if not intellectual collaborations, they, they give fellows like Lauren a chance to talk about their ideas. And that, that enables them to mature much more quickly and uh, come to fruition. So the, the table is, is really... Uh, I would say, you know, like people's studios and like the library, it's a research venue for the institution. And similarly, one of the great things that Laura did when she was there was to get involved in the, the uh, Rome Sustainable Food Project's kitchen garden. So we grow a lot of our vegetables on site. And in fact, we're going to be expanding, uh, really doubling the amount of space that we devote to growing food on site. And it's not just because the food is good. It's because of a philosophical view that sees the kitchen garden, but also the larger garden in which it sits as a research facility. You know, maybe we're not botanists, uh, so it's not research in that very strict sense, but it's research in exactly the same way that artists talk about doing research. It's, it's somewhere north of trial and error, where people get to experiment, to be stimulated, to ask questions of themselves and of the world, and in a kind of back and forth with those questions, 
work evolves, advances. And, and we feel that the natural setting of the institution is very much a part of that. We own a number of properties with gardens. I think we have about 12 acres altogether uh, that we take care of. We have some fantastic trees. We have uh, in the courtyard itself, somehow they managed to wedge in these giant cypress trees. Of course, they started as little cypress trees uh, and now they overtop the building itself. We have a couple of beautiful 150 year old, if not more, cedars of Lebanon. So there, there are lots of things to look at and to take seriously. Another thing Lauren said that, you know, could be considered casual, but again, like the table and like the garden, I actually think is essential, is community. So I was thinking about this last night, actually. One of the things, there are lots of, there are lots of artist residencies, there are lots of research institutes. I think what's, you know, I, I, could, I could try and build a list of what's unique about the academy, but what I would say for now is that it's a remarkably well-integrated human community on so many different levels. Uh, whether it's boisterous playing of pool long into the night or intellectual conversation or fellows showing films that they've made to other fellows in a kind of informal setting. You know, there are so many ways in which people connect creatively that, that are not part of the official mission of the institution, not part of people's official proposal, but all of those things drive people's mental life. And so the richness of what exists at the academy has to make the work that's produced there uh, that much better. And, and I think so many fellows, Sean hears this for year after year, you know, so many fellows will say, oh, it changed my life. And it's not because they wrote a book or uh, prepared paintings for an exhibition. It's something deeper than that. It has to do with uh, an experience that affects you on multiple levels. And I think the Academy does that better than a lot of other places. Um, so all of this human stuff actually matters an enormous amount. And uh, it's, it's neither casual nor is it unconscious on our part. There's a lot of thoughtfulness and, you know, in 130 years, you could figure a few things out. Uh, and so we have. Uh, I think that's, that's the way I would stop. I mean, obviously, Rome is an extraordinary place in terms of landscape, in terms of thinking about the way in which landscapes change over time, the, the way humans, I mean, Rome as a laboratory for reuse of space is there there may be no better laboratory on the planet. Uh, even Athens had much longer periods of abandonment uh, than Rome. So uh, I think it's a it's a wonderful place in general, but I think it, it offers special opportunities for landscape architecture. Peter, I couldn't have said that any better. It was so Perfect, because you just made me realize, I mean, you said, why Rome, you know, and I answered, oh, because I went to, Ad that's all true. But when my friend said to me, you're just not going to believe the quality of the environment and the kind of things that you're going to be motivated and stimulated to do, because the academy, he literally said, has got it figured out, because his wife had done a residency there. And he said, knowing you and you know, your ethic with, you know, my husband and I have been growing our own animals for meat here on our land. So we care a lot about things, you know, related to farm to table on our own farm and my interest in the arts and the way that I've been trying so hard to create this, you know, community and culture belonging in my firm, which is so hard to do post COVID. It, all these things that I feel like the Academy has figured out and hasn't compromised on, you know, they have it was very attractive to me. So I guess what I'm saying is, I'm not sure that 
Rome in a way, I mean, Rome of course matters, but it's the American Academy in Rome is what drew me to this fellowship. And I would absolutely echo everything that you said. I think it's extremely special and I don't know yet how it will impact me, but I know that I have struggled since I've gotten home to find my feet at home because Rome is so special. Okay. Um, well, I think at this point we should open this up to questions. So uh, for those of you who do have questions, you can put them in the Q&A section. And I would also recommend that if you can focus your questions more towards Lauren than just general questions, you can always ask me those at a later time uh, to do so now. You might not have a chance to talk to a Rome Prize winner again before the application. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first one is, uh, someone has asked, I'm curious if you could speak more about how your kids adjusted to life in Rome with the language, school, daycare options, et cetera. Yeah, sure. Um, we decided to just throw them into the fire and our youngest <laughs> went to a daycare called Philobus, um, which is about a mile walk. Um, quickly, our kids learned how to ride little bikes that we got from like a flea market. And so we could keep, we could keep these little bikes at the academy locked inside. There's a whole, actually we left them there. So next, this year's cohort can use them. It's probably using them. So um, we would walk our child to a local preschool um, and he would ride his bike. And then on the way we drop our daughter, who also that preschool was 100% Italian. Um, and speaking, <laughs> there were a couple other kids from the academy, so he had some friends that he could speak English with, but all the teachers spoke Italian. We just wanted it that way. We're in Italy, so why not? Um, we thought that was important. Our daughter went to a Roman Catholic Italian school with nuns who literally pulled the boys by the ears, you know, at the playground. <laughs> um, and that was harder. She was six, uh, no, seven, she had just turned seven, and she she had a hard time, was just at that age where she felt a little bit left out, um, but was right at home with the kids in the academy. So every day she would come home and just totally let loose and had the whole run of 5B, which is the apartment building with all the other families. So whatever your kids can't get at the school, be assured that they will get it at the academy <laughs> in the living situation. That was our experience. Um, I wouldn't have done it any differently. I thought being able to walk our children to school and having them in Italian um, schools was fantastic. Okay, uh, looking back, is there anything you'd do differently to prepare for the fellowship experience? Um, we did a lot to prepare. We had to sell, remember, we had to sell our cows and our sheep got donated to the Audubon. We have no animals right now. Um, I don't think so. I think maybe I would have figured out a way to maybe have more contact with my um, with my crew back home at Stimson at my firm. I felt guilty that I was gone. I missed being part of that, but I also felt like I needed the break and I knew enough of what was happening through my husband. So I think for any practitioner that leaves, you're going to have that feeling of, um, am I really, does this feel selfish? You know, am I doing the right thing? Like when you're a leader of a crew and you feel, you know, indebted to them for, for the time that you're taking away, but I'm not sure I could have done it any differently. So it's good to not have regrets. Yeah. <laughs> um, did your project change from your initial proposal during your time in Rome? And if so, how and why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I thought that I was going to be traveling to all these far off places documenting rural wildness, which is what I'm really interested in some of my work here. But it became clear between like school drop offs and, um, you know, having two children there and my husband's schedule because he was working full time, you know, with a six hour time difference that I couldn't really just get on a train and leave and go up to, you know, different parts of Italy whenever I wanted. So I ended up studying mostly places in Rome and uh, I would call it more like urban wildness and well or you know Rome is pretty rural there's there's a lot of ruralness in Rome so I sought out those you know sort of forgotten places so yeah I would say I changed my tune when I got there and adapted and then also I thought I was going to do a lot more um, mixed media studies with fiber and things beyond painting and I just got so into the painting and I had friends that I made who were in my cohort that were also painters and I got to learn from them and 
So I just immersed myself in that and said, you know what, this is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Let's see, what do we have next? Um, as someone not coming from academia, how do you, how did you find the find or decide on who your recommenders would be? Oh, that was pretty easy. I tend to go with my instinct of who I feel knows me best. So I chose two professional recommendation letters from um, two people who were clients. One has become kind of a surrogate older brother, father figure to me. Um, so again, client, professional, but have, we no longer work together and it's been like over a decade of friendship. Um, so that person, he was a museum director. And then the other person was a, also became a colleague. Um, he was client, became a friend, left his position, but he was also director of an institution that I worked at. And then the third was, I am, I'd say pretty active with my alma mater at UMass. And I've been, you know, between reviews and establishing a scholarship there, I have been in touch with three of my graduate professors who were, I would say equally informed the way I think as a designer. So I wanted them to speak for me um, on my behalf. So I had one academic, you know, this trifecta of academic recommendation and then two from professionals. See what else we have. Uh, did you find it hard to resist the social aspects of the academy in order to dedicate time to your studio? <laughs> oh, I think you should rephrase that. Did you find it hard to resist the social aspects in order to dedicate time to your husband and kids? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, that would be true. And my husband would echo that. I absolutely took advantage of my studio time. I would say I was pretty selfish about it. And I selfish meaning, you know, from my family. <laughs> um, I spent as much time in that studio as I possibly could and I hit the ground running. And I was totally so productive because I had no distractions. And yes, the distractions at the academy, it's not the same, like going to a lecture that, you know, someone's giving, that's, I don't see that as a distraction, that's a bonus. <laughs> like I live in a world where, a distraction is another client calling you while you're on the phone with a client. So everything at the academy for me coming from practice just seemed easy and amazing and fun. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. I think other people who are in practice would understand, like if you can imagine stepping away from all of your clients in your business obligations, there's no, the social stuff at the academy is like ice cream. <laughs> You know, it's really incredible. Yes, there's a lot of options and things to do, but sometimes you say no, sometimes you go and you just figure out the balance. But I, I felt like I had so much time because I had no work. I didn't have to work, you know, like my real job. So everything just seemed easy to me. Does that sound, I didn't mean it to sound like arrogant. I just mean the freedom of time was unbelievable. And my kids were in school all day. I mean, that was, what a gift, you know? That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, how did you decide on what to include in your application portfolio? Oh, probably again, just instinct. Like what are the projects that most speak to my design sensibility or my particular, whatever is going on up here that I need to figure out and wanted to focus on in Rome. I chose those projects. Um, I, there's a lot of stuff I've worked on, obviously, um, many, many years of work. And I, I kind of picked my favorites that really felt like mine. Um, obviously it's a team effort. You know, it's hard when you're in practice, you obviously you have a lot of team members. What I did, and this is important, I think for me, it was at the end, I list everyone in my office or studio that worked on that project with me and tried to make sure that I gave other people, you know, credit where credit was due because nothing is ever, you know, you're not your own person flying solo when you're in a practice building these projects that are totally collaborative. So, um, but yeah, I tried to pick the things that really represented the way I think. And cause we have five principles in the studio. So that was what I thought was nice was when I met with the jury, I remember them saying that they felt like my voice really came through. I tend to speak and write from an eye perspective, which is probably not that normal when you're in a professional design context. So that helps me too. Don't be afraid to say I. 
<laughs> Let's see. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Let's, uh... Oh, okay. What was the interview process like for you? Did they ask you anything surprising? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got COVID for the first time. Called Sean right. crying because I said, I'm going to miss my interview. I can't come down. I've got COVID. Who's going to give the Rome Prize to someone who gets COVID and has to do it over <laughs> Zoom? And he, he said, no, 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 just do it over Zoom. So I did. And um, I had a fever of 103. It was awful. I was like sweating and I had my pajama <laughs> pants on, but I was like dressed up from the like, waist up, you know, classic COVID scenario. And I remember somebody saying to me, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to um, use this as a stepping stone or a pivot to start your own practice when you come back, which a lot of landscape architects do over the years. When you look at the history of, you know, people who are practitioners who have then after the room prize gone and launched something. And I remember looking like to see if my husband was like across the hallway, <laughs> could he hear the question? And, um, it was a very personal question. It was almost um, like too personal because obviously when you're in business with your life partner, it, that's a whole other ball of wax. And that was part of why I wanted to apply and have a break and do something for myself also. Um, but I would say um, the jury was very candid and pointed with their questions. We got very personal, but I'm also that type of person. So I think they felt comfortable asking me things. So I'm not sure if this helps at all, but you just have to show, show yourself. I mean, you're going to a place where you're not going to be, um, it's not an office job, right? You don't go to the academy and you sit at a desk job or you go hide in your studio. Like this is a community experience. It's, it's like even more communal than college for me. Cause I had like a husband and children there. So the jury, I used the jury time to ask them questions because most of them had been there about what their life was like there. <laughs> because I was almost feeling like, I don't know if, can I, is this right for my family right now? And I, I used that time to ask them a lot of questions too. So that's what my jury experience was like. I didn't know about the Zoom session. I don't even know if you had one back then, but this is unbelievable. Like I would have loved to have this chance to talk to somebody beforehand. So thanks for doing this. Sure, yeah, we weren't doing this at that time. So yeah, it's great. I'm glad we we're able to do it. Well, I think that's it for our time, but I just, I, I really want to thank you, Lauren. Uh, it was uh, great hearing, hearing more, hearing in person. I'd read your report and it was, but it was really good to hear in person about your experience and, uh, and thank you. And thanks, Peter, for joining us. Peter, do you want to? Uh, Lauren, thank you. It's great, great to hear you and see you again, albeit mediated. And uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts. Thanks to all of you who participated in this. Uh, and called in from wherever you are. Um, if you have more questions, you can always address them either to Sean or to me. We're happy to answer. And uh, you know, we look forward to seeing your applications before too long. Thank you. If anyone wants to contact me, you can contact me through info at stimsonstudio.com. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Thanks, Lauren. Seriously, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big lift. It's a big deal to apply for something like this. So I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you, Peter and Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.